if you know towns like Westfield mm-hmm. and Warren and stuff, the nice towns, the realtors there, excuse my language, yeah. one, they're all egotistical dipshits. <laughs> Two, not all of them, but there's okay. a few of them. All right, so I'm here today with Sonny Nogueira, legend of the making, uh, friend, prince of Newark, I want, right? You kind of think <laughs> about it. Or at least the real estate industry. Unofficial at title, Unofficial. prince of Newark. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite question to open up with is... Not where did you grow up, but what did you grow up in? Did you grow up in a house, apartments? What was your majority look like? So I I grew up uh, in an apartment in Newark. Uh, My dad did own the building, but we grew up in a like a three bed, four bedroom apartment uh, there in the Ironbound. And when I was like five or six, we moved into a house. Mm. So I kind of had both both growing up. And where was the house? Uh, the house we moved right into Warren. Oh, so you did really the Portuguese exodus? The, yeah, yeah. The, the the Portuguese migration. You go from <laughs> Portugal, your parents moved to Newark, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're in Warren Boy. or Watchung yeah, or that's Bridgewater. It. That's a little bit out west. Yeah, the and Warren, then you don't move for twenty years. <laughs> okay, so are you guys still in the house you moved into? Like when yeah. you were five? Stop. Still you guys there. stayed committed. It's a nice house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice area. It's a nice house. Okay. It's a, yeah. It's so let me ask you a question. What would it, what do you think, what impact do you think living in Warren in a nice single family house, what did it kind of impact you life wise in contrast to if you would have stayed in that three or four bedroom apartment in Newark? Definitely a safer neighborhood, slightly better education, but also just like if I stayed in Newark, I'd probably be better at sports. Mm-hmm. People kind of look at you a different way when you're from an apartment in Newark versus a nice single family in a town like Warren. Mm-hmm. It kind of, for sure, you kind of uh, you look. There's a like a connotation way. to yeah. it, right? Like, oh, I'm from Newark, <laughs> yeah. versus like, oh, I'm from Warren. Like, you know, yeah. I a, feel like you're a little more boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you, and do you think like having that kind of boring connotation? Because I honestly, for you, I don't think you're a boring guy. This is we haven't spoken like detail quite some time. Excited to catch up. What I remember is that you obviously grew up, you know, your father, Louis Nogueira, owns Exit Realty, et cetera, right? Or Exit Realty Lucky, right? Yeah. He's very well for himself, you know, came from literally immigrants to boom. I remember even one time your dad told me a story, and this stuck with me for like six years, literally, <laughs> that he like sold his car to a friend so he could afford to go full time into real estate, and his friend didn't have all the money up front, so he like paid him half and was supposed to pay him the other half. His, his friend screwed him, never paid him the other half. And then He's, your dad would take the bus on showings. He and, sold his car for like 14000 His pen, I think his friend gave him like a 1000 bucks. Oh, my God. And he never saw the rest <laughs> of the money. Oh, it wasn't even half. <laughs> yeah, no, oh, not even no. half. Oh, no. Okay, I didn't know that. Total screwed. <laughs> oh, that's heartbreaking. Okay, so you have that. Oh, that's actually really bad. <laughs> but you grew up in the real estate world. And, but then you got into like more of like a musician, like a creative approach. Yeah. Um, so like uh, my question is like, do you think that if you had stayed in the three or four bedroom apartment, and this is a genuine question because you said the connotation of boring. I don't see you as boring from a guy in Warren, but do you think if you had stayed in Newark, anything would have been different now as you let, like, because you, I think maybe, you know what, do you think it would be different at all or? I don't know. Because there's the thing, there's the aspect of now you're getting my mind onto my Mm-hmm. crazy theories about oh, time please. and stuff where yeah sure if you could throw we could throw a rock in the water mm-hmm. and make a ripple but it's not going to change the effect yeah um but who knows because if i didn't move to warren and meet the people that i met i don't know if that i would have fell so in love with music mm. that because i'm obsessed i'm obsessed yeah. with everything to do with music and wow. i started that at a young age and I don't know if we moved out there, if my sister would have met the friends she met that got her on the music that I that she got me on to. So who knows what would have happened. I think maybe I would have been more of a different style of music, mm. but But you think you still would have gotten it? Well, I guess you never know. We never know. I but. think that's like the crazy thing about like when you think about the impact real estate has, not only like the aesthetic, right? Being in like there's studies that show like if you're in a clean space, like organized space, you're more productive, right? Yeah. So like the physical space you're in has such an impact, like visually has such an impact on how you literally behave, how you think, how you feel. So if you think about like getting away from the city life to Warren, making those introductions and real, like literally real estate moving you around. Right. Cause if you guys were in real estate, I highly doubt 
you know, life is very unaffordable. Maybe how else would you guys be able to buy that single family? You know what I mean? So that's another way that that kind of gives you the opportunity to build those relationships with people who have the financial means to get into music. Yeah, that's true. Music is an expensive expensive. hobby. Oh, my God. I I, I don't even want to tell you how much I've spent on music. I don't want to hear it. (laughs) Okay, so um, walk me through a little bit. Because I, I, you just you mentioned right before we got on the podcast that you made the industry change to audio. Before that, I let's give the you know the hopefully the millions of listeners or probably like a dozen of you guys um, <laughs> that are listening in. Help me understand when because when you, you and I first met, I first got into real estate. I joined Exit Realty Lucky. Uh, I was a dumb you know insubordinate, ungrateful kid, <laughs> and still like am just dumb and insubordinate. I'm just a little bit older. Um, <laughs> And then basically we go there. A little wiser. A little wiser. <laughs> just like a grain of like salt here. But we go there. I'm joining Exit Realty Lucky. I went there actually because Juan Carlos. I don't know if you remember him. Juan yeah, Carlos. Of course. Yeah, super cool dude. Also likes music. Uh, doesn't love music like you, but he's, yeah. Yeah, he's more in the ministry. Anyways, so he gets me into Exit Realty. Uh, your dad was like this really tough guy. At the time, I thought he was like a hard ass. I was like, why is he this guy so tough? I was like, what's wrong with him? Now... I recognize, I even reached out to your dad recently and apologized to him. I was like, oh, I really was such a hard, I didn't understand. I just recently, this maybe like a few months ago. And because with my team now, I see what he was saying. Oh, yeah. So like he would always tell me like, I would be late to the office, let's say it was 9 o'clock, and I would get there at like 9, like 15, 9, 20. Yep. And I'd be like, are you a loser? And he would like smoke <laughs> me. And I'm like, what the hell is up with this guy? Yeah. But I realized now with my team, it's not that you're actually being mean. It's that your dad actually like, he cared. And it's, it's tough to accept this as like a 23, 24 year old punk, but like your dad actually cared about me enough to be like, Hey, don't be a loser. Yeah. You know, that's what he was saying. It's, he's got a funny way of showing love, but it's, yeah. he's, he's a hard ass. Cause he's an old school Portuguese guy. He grew up on a farm literally with his dad. Yeah. Literally in Portugal farm life. His dad owned a limousine and a farm that he would drive the limousine around with people on the farm. <laughs> But then he would just be, he was a farmer and his dad was a hard ass like him. And he, that's just how he shows it. So with his agents, he, he's the exact same way. He, yeah. discipline is it, but he's, yeah. it's not that he's like trying to be mean to you yeah. or anything. It's because he actually cares yes. for you to do well. So he wants you in the office at nine o'clock. He yeah. wants you to yeah. go on these appointments. He wants you to make calls. He, and if you, if you don't, if he knows that you're not doing it, He's going to hassle you about it. Yeah. And I think it's a, well, that's what I've learned. I think I learned the hassling, it gets so exhausting to hassle people. It gets so exhausting. So at a certain point, I, I even I think I'm looking back, I realized your dad's just like, well, listen, I can only bring you so far. You got to do the rest. Exactly. So, okay. So I meet you. That's 2017. So we're at 23, 20. We're at the same age, right? Yeah. Um, and you are doing a lot of rentals, some listings, way different way different backgrounds, right? So I grew up like, you know, very low income, incarceration, craziness, all that stuff, right? And I get into real estate. I remember, uh, once again, maybe I need your dad on this podcast actually too because I'm thinking about so many stories that you're here. <laughs> but he asked like, what's the most amount of money you want to make? Like, what's your goal financially? And I thought about my brother. My brother went to BCG, works at BCG, very does very well, et cetera. Went to Harvard, speaks six languages, worked for Michelle Obama, like second tier, like crazy, right? Yeah, so I'm sick. like, okay, I can make like $60,000. I'd be mind blown. At the time, that was oh, yeah. the most amount of money humanly possible in my brain. Yeah, like, and when I was a teenager, I was like, I didn't even, exp- he would ask me the same questions, obviously, mm. and I'd be like, well, 60 would be nice, and I've when I was like 18, I didn't, I never envisioned myself mm. making $60,000 a year. Insane. I was, when I was 22, when you joined, I was like, I'm just happy to be alive. I was <laughs> like, I'm not, I could be dead in a ditch somewhere, but yeah. I'm, I'm here, I'm alive. I didn't expect to be making money. Yeah. Let alone sixty thousand. I get paid like for this. So much money to me. Yeah. What was it like? I think because I had another gentleman here. His name was uh, Julian Fuentes, right? His dad uh, also that was very inter- interesting. They have the Fuentes Group right now. It's real brokerage. They do pretty well. They have like a hundred agents the whole night. And he talked about he grew up in the office, and his dad had a very, very, very interesting approach. Only time I've ever heard this from a real estate professional guy, immigrant who came up from nothing and like built, built, built his way up, and how he treats kid. He said his dad would constantly tell him that he didn't have to get into real estate, and it was absolutely optional, and there was zero pressure whatsoever. And he's like, if you do anything, I'll support you as long as you're on the right path. 
like you know honoring God because they were like Christian heavy. Uh-huh. So they were like, that's like what his father did to him. I don't think I have a ten month old son. And my <laughs> wife asked me, like, someone asked me, oh, what do you want to be? I'm like, oh, he's going to take over my business. That's the only option. Yeah. Like, what else would he do? And I thought to myself, I said, and then Julian was on the podcast and he said that to me. And I was like, wait. And Julian then came full circle. And he said, you know what? After I saw this, I actually got into real estate because my dad, like, I never thought I was going to in. And then when I was like 19, 20, I was like, maybe I should try this. And then he got into it. Huh. So it was That's like, the, cool. I was so opposite because yeah. I'm like, no, I'll push my son into this thing. He's well, doing it. Was your dad in real estate? No, no, my dad was like, he was in the graphic design. He was very entrepreneurial. The only reason why I got into real estate was because I couldn't get a job anywhere because I had a record. That's the only reason I got into real estate. Fair I enough. couldn't get a job. So then like the real estate commission let me in. <laughs> so yeah. Said, okay. It depends on what your, <laughs> yeah, your I record is. And they said, okay, boom, come on in. But I okay. had a record. Yeah, I that's I true. got that shit exposed. Yeah, good man. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. This matter. Cool, cool. This is not a PG uh, podcast. Uh, <laughs> no. So basically, though, what was it like for you to get into the industry? Like, how did that impact your working relationship, working with family? Did you work? You only worked with your dad. Your did your sister was ever real estate or no? They have their license. Both of them have mm-hmm. their licenses. My sisters, but they, uh, apart from like when they were younger, doing mm-hmm. secretary work as like a college job, mm-hmm. then they didn't really ever. Go for it now in real estate. So what would you, okay, what would you, how would you say that real estate industry impacts family life as a small business? Like how does that work? Do you guys go to dinner and then talk about real estate? Is there like an off switch? What does that look like? So I got into real estate because I, I was 18. I had gone to college for two months and I dropped out. <laughs> I was like, I, I can't do this. I hate this place so much because <laughs> I, I, my, <laughs> I went because by like, uh, I guess my parents expected me to. And I was like, that's what you're supposed to go do is go to college, get yeah. a degree. Two months in, I remember I got a history paper. It was like a random, but it was like 28 page history paper. I was just like, it has Gosh. to be minimum 28 pages. I was like. Nah. <laughs> I was like, I'm not. I was like, I'm not in the right place here. This is not for me. I was like, I'm a marketing major. Why am I? No. Mm. So I had a conversation with my mom. She was like, you have to talk with your father. I had a conversation with my dad. He flipped out. He was like, a waste of money, whatever. <laughs> and then he was like, what are you going to do? Yeah. I was like, I, I don't know. For now, I'm just going to get a regular job and just like... Think about it and figure it out. He was like, no, you're coming to real estate with me. Mm. So I didn't really have too much of a choice. I was kind of like thrown right into, mm. the, into the fire of real estate. And I slowly got more into it, more into it. I got my license when I was 19. And then from there, it was just working every day full time in real estate. The dynamic between me and him, he was a great, he is a great mentor. Mm. He knows everything knows about everything. everything. Knows everything. It's it's nuts. Yeah, you can't. It's like be, you'd think he's be. a know it all, but he actually is. You just know, like imagine, <laughs> like, like imagine if I were to stay in real estate for another twenty years, how much more I would possibly know. I couldn't even compete with. It would yeah. be like a. He's, he's amount. coming up on forty. You see, years. okay, perfect. So if I stayed Which in real estate another thirty-three years, how much more would I know? Yeah, a ton. just like think about, it. just like, and his approach you, is that he's he's like I've been in this business forty years and I still don't know anything. Poof. He's he's like I'm learning every day. Things change every day. I don't yeah. know anything. What a legend of a man. <laughs> okay, so you were saying so when you got into real estate, how does the dynamic switch now that you're working alongside one another and you are like the son? Yeah. So there's like that. But it wasn't pre- like he treated me more harshly like because I was his son. Okay, cool. He treated me as an equal to everyone else. Mm. Do you think you got more opportunity because you were a son? Probably a bit. Mm-hmm. Not going to lie. No, of course. You got I, more. I would imagine too. Yeah. <laughs> you got a little like, more opportunity. Of course. I would give a lot more opportunity. I said, you're my but, kid. You better give him what you want. <laughs> I mean, like... I'm not a son. I'm listing just an employee. And stuff. I mean, but the opportunity was more so like he would take on a listing and have me as his co-listing agent. Oh, you were like, yeah, you were basically like a team member. Yeah, That's more of a team member yeah. rather than like, oh, new listing, give it to Sonny. Yeah. It so was never he, like that. No, yeah, no. Okay, so if it was like, okay, he would work it, work it, work it, the relationship, et cetera, and then you'd run the listing. Pretty much. Essentially. Yeah, that's a move. That's yeah, yeah. I do the same thing with the team. Not, they're not my son. They're just like, okay, yeah. you're competent. I trust you. I like you. I want to work with you. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. All good. Uh, but yeah, then the dynamic switch of like, once we go home, we, we're with each other every single day, mm-hmm. all day, 
for nine, ten years now, ten years. We've been with each other every day, all day. Do you guys talk about real estate when you're not in the space, physical space of real estate? Yeah, and I would hate it. <laughs> oh yeah. But I would get we'd get home and go to dinner, and um, we'd be eating dinner or something, and then he would. It would just be fine, and then he would bring something up from work. Like, did you did you do this? Did you finish this? Did you recall this person? Mm-hmm. Did you uh, file that listing? Blah blah blah. I'd be like, dude, can't mm-hmm. wait till tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. So it was something like that, but it was never. It was more just like checking up. But there was the switch was that when we went home, we just not because of bad blood. We just wouldn't talk because we've been with each other all day already Mm -hmm. so we'd go home and just like mind our own business okay yeah well you need this it's the same thing like this space there's a lot there's a friend i have that her and her husband are like a team like a you know they run their like real estate probably do like 80 units a year the two of them 70 units so they do pretty well right yeah like really well for two people like they're very they're super content they're very financially wise power couple power couple love it but that's one thing they talk about a lot that there is like they don't see like work-life balance he said we don't have that. We, our work is our life and our life is our work and we just live and work together. But they do have, um, they don't actually believe in like saying, hey, we're not going to talk about work right now because the thing is like work brings us joy. It's part of our life. We just always can talk about it. So I'm like, <sighs> it depends what you do. Like, That's I guess tough. You got to love it. You got to love it. Yeah, you really, got to be in it, love with love. what you're doing. Like that's your passion. But for both of them. Yeah. And for them, it, for them it is. But I don't think like, so for you, you see like you got into real estate at like 18, 19, like, okay, I'll, I'll do this. It yeah. wasn't like, like if you, it would be different. Like if your dad was like a musician, right? And he's like, okay, Tori. And you're like, let's talk about music every single day for the rest of our lives. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, let's go. Right. But when it's real estate, I'm just like, oh, I've mm-hmm. had enough for the day. Like, let yeah. me just go. For you, it's work. Real estate's work. Especially because for the past 10 years since then, since before then, but since I've been working in real estate. I'd go home and that was my time. I never had an off switch for mm. me, quote unquote, working. I would get home, eat dinner, and immediately start working on music and stuff. Mm. So I'm not like sit at home, watch TV after work, just yeah. to dwindle down. I'm up till one, two in the morning after I get home from work, still working, just working on music instead. Mm. And it's been years of that. So I never had that off switch of relaxing at home mm. i mean obviously some nights you gotta play some yeah. fifa yeah i got <laughs> watch some marvel movies but yeah, it's, I, mean, I always i was i'm always constantly my mind's always going with how it. do you think that impacted you never uh, like not being able to really just like unplug and oh, i got work. so burnt out okay would you mind i think that is a massive massive thing in like the brazilian portuguese latino etc community that we really never talk about how real estate does impact us in our like daily lives for me i've gone through severe burnout and I've learned so much, and it was quite humbling. What would, when you talk about burnout, what people that's like a hot button word. What does that What does that look like? What does that mean to you? After working full time in real estate, but maybe if I took some time to myself and actually relaxed, I wouldn't have been so burnt out. But the fact that I was still like part time doing music every day until one in the morning, and then having to wake up at seven to get ready to go to work. After a few years of that, you just start lacking motivation and all of it and music and real estate and my body's just tired. My head's tired. My head's constantly racing that thanks to ADHD as well. Mm -hmm. But, but, and then I would go, I would have to go from dealing with no offense to anybody, but dealing with idiots in the real estate world because there's so many of them and i'm not just talking about realtors i'm talking about the real estate professionals attorney the lender the inspector title company insurance so many frustrating city official high frequency just you gotta you gotta relax a little bit and when you don't give yourself the time to relax and let go of it it eats up at you like at your mental health Mm. And definitely just like I was getting my dad noticed I was getting frustrated every minute if something little would go wrong, like an oil inspection would go like, oh, this oil tank has a hole in it. We got to do a it's contaminated, blah, blah. blah. I would freak out. Mm. Like, what the F is going yeah. on? God damn it. What? The? Yeah. And I would just lose it at my desk. He'd be like, you got to relax. But go you were vacation. so. Yeah. <laughs> But I would go on vacation, come back, and it'd be the same thing. I couldn't do it anymore. 
And I don't know. How do you explain a burnout? It's I think like, you're doing okay. So you're doing a great job, actually. You just go into a hole of depression. I think and it's just, <laughs> so. Like okay, so burnout isn't solved by like a week vacation. No. Burnout really takes two things. And I've like I got like coaching. Literally, I paid this like coach to help me get out of burnout. Right. There's three things I've seen if you really want to solve burnout. Okay. I'm gonna go immediate. I'll go high level. Now I'll go deep. Okay. So like the highest level is you need to unplug. And we're not talking a week. We're talking like you need to go on vacation two, three, four weeks. Like you're out. I'm ideally you're on vacation three weeks. I just did that. I just right when I stopped working in real estate, I just like a month or two, I just totally shut off my brain. And how was that? Rejuvenating, probably. It, the first few weeks were really tough because I oh, felt yes. so guilty oh, for leaving. That's number three. That's, that's number, number three. three. That, you'll see what happens. Okay, so let me hit you with this. And, I mean, I'm, oh, I love that we're talking about this right now. Because I'm, so, <laughs> I'm so passionate about like not allowing like well, the industry. That I, like You love music. I love real estate. Yeah. Like, and I, really, I could talk about real estate every day for the rest of my life. Like, I and I that. really do love it with all my soul, like truly deep love it. Not just the idea of like real estate in terms of sales, but in running a small business in impacting people, putting in, people in homes, oh, not, helping not, not, that probably actually, that's what I like. No, about that it. actually, I don't like that much about it. So <laughs> I, that's, that's a little interesting. Different. So I don't really love like, uh, sorry, I, say, I don't love selling people's houses and getting them a lot of money. That gives me no joy. No, no, no. I like to find. I like to help people find their like buyers oh, find no. their yeah, no, that's good. Yes. dream house and seeing the look on their yes. face of like how happy they are. That's I'm just a like, beautiful. Oh, that's yeah. great. And then like years later, you, they come. They're like, oh, why don't you stop by? You stop by. Yeah. And they're all happy to see you. That's an amazing feeling. That's actually one of the best feelings. But selling people's houses and make them a lot of money, not good. Yeah, I will say. I just put money in our pockets, but that's that. That and the money in your pocket, like the more money you make, for that, (laughs) the more money you make, the less the joy you get from them check is. So that's like a really diminishing return very quickly. But I just sold this lady's house in Irvington. She was pre foreclosure. She was going to lose her house in three months. We got it closed in like forty seven days, and we and she ended up walking with one hundred and seven thousand dollars. Especially for pre foreclosure. It was crazy. It was insane. But she already was working with someone prior, like a um, foreclosure person, like whatever. So it was all right. we didn't, we're not heroes here. But uh, we ended up, wa- she wanted like 275 We got her 310 uh, as is. We fixed the house for her for CO to pass. Ooh, like, and go. we even to get temp CO and everything. And then she ended up walking with stuff like, around here sometimes. Oh, was fixing some small stuff around. <laughs> but she ended up walking with $110,000. When I tell you this lady cried, she was going to lose it. She was going to lose it. She was like, it was insane situation. It was crazy. She owed tax. Every, it just, it shouldn't, she should never have been a homeowner. Yeah. That's the truth. But she walked with $110,000. We gave her coaching on how to handle that money thereafter. We connected her saying, hey, here are the resources you're going to need to not waste this money. And then when I sold the house, she came here. And she literally was like, I will do anything I can. Thank you so much. And my heart was like, I didn't help a rich person get richer. I helped a person solve a problem that impacted their life. And that was great. And that probably changed the course so you don't even realize that probably changed the course of her in the next 10 to 20 years. Oh my God. She's like, this woman was like, literally, <laughs> you would think I saved her life. Yeah. And when honestly, you have someone in that kind of low income neighborhood get, <sighs> get $110,000. Not only that, she's about to be homeless. And then tell she had them no money in the bank. She was going to be homeless. That you get them in an apartment, you tell them how to invest a little bit, and then boom, they're done. They're golden. For she 10, was going to get, and she has a years. good job. She just literally, the house kept having issues. She couldn't fall behind. The furnace broke. It was like 12 grand fixed. She didn't have it. She then, her do- she was supporting her 28-year-old daughter. She was like basically enabling this woman who's a grown woman, letting her live with her for free, all enabling. I told her, I said, you're enabling. And she had yeah. another daughter at 17 years old who she's like, all I want to do is get her a car so she can go to college. There's the siren. Oh, the sirens. Oh, yeah, they pull up. They pull up. <laughs> and that one is the Newark Emergency Services. God bless you guys. Get there safely. Um, no, but let, let me tell you three things for burnout. How you really... Like rip it out of its root in the, how because real estate can cause you into burnouts. Here's how you rip it out of root. The first thing is you go away for about three weeks. Don't be surprised if you feel guilty. We'll get to that in the second. Oh three. yeah. The second thing is you must make a systemic change because the way that you were working was not sustainable. That's why you got burnt out. You were working in such a capacity that you couldn't sustain it. What does that look like? That looks like. Six hour that looks like six day work weeks, that looks like seven day work weeks, that looks like picking up calls when you're home, that looks like a lack of boundaries, that looks like over commitment, that can look like a lot of things. So, you have fundamental changes. I recommend hiring a coach, getting counseling, whatever you need to do, time blocking if you want to go very pragmatic. Here's when I'm working, here's when I pick up therapy, and that's number three. 
Number three is underrated, super underrated, necessary. If you're ever experiencing burnout, or especially if for professionals in real estate, nobody in real estate and <sighs> stocks and everything professional on our team, nobody realizes. On our team, we pay for each agent to get twenty free counseling sessions a year. Oh, that's amazing. We have to do it. Because the industry takes such That's a That's something that I thought I should talk to my dad about you doing, do but it's, we can't afford to do that. Do you know how much it costs each one at each session? $75. I'll do bulk discounts. When you send you know, 150 sessions a year, they give you a bulk rate. Well, the good thing is that a lot of insurance companies are paying for it now. The insurance, I should have. I don't know how my to, copay was like 10 Okay, bucks. if you can teach me how to do that, I'll be happy. But yeah. here's the third way you really rip away. Um, here's a third step to ripping out the, the deepest layer of burnout. You have to ask yourself this question. After you've made the systemic changes, right? But really, the systemic changes are called secondary orders of change. They're the fruit on the branches. Instead of worrying about the fruit on the branches, you got to worry about the roots of the tree. And what that looks like is you have to ask yourself, why do I not love myself? Why am I striving so manically? Why am I working so out of a place of fear compulsively that I have worked myself into burnout. And if you don't question that, if you don't recognize, why am I ashamed? Why am I, what am I trying to prove? There's, you never, you're just going to be in the cycle. That's a great point. Especially the fear. It was like the fear of not being successful, the fear of not having enough money, the fear of losing the people around you because mm-hmm. of your financial you you stay in the same job and you stay in the same business and you stay in that vicious cycle because yeah. you're scared of what would happen if you leave. Mm-hmm. And it's all shame based because we're fear of reject we're fear of rejection. We're afraid that we're not worthy of that. We don't like Brene Brown. She says to me like, when you get to a place that you realize your worthiness is a birthright, you had it at birth, and like especially I'm Christian, like that's even higher, right? It's like God made us, like He loves us, right? Like. L O V E, <laughs> like God loves so much. He's like, Hey, you're mine. And then you come from that place, like, and I'm in there right now. I'm realizing so much. My mindset with real estate, how it's impacted my life, was I had a lot of like abandonment growing up. I had a lot of rejection, et cetera. So what I did is like, and a lot of shame. And I felt like I was very unwanted. So what I did in real estate, through real estate, I realized now, and it helped me be, become successful. Yeah. And honestly, it was unbelievable. <laughs> but it had a negative, it was good and bad. Here's the bad. Very good, very grateful. God bless. Thank you, Lord. Bad because what I did was like I had like a knife of like a wound and that wound was like abandonment. And from that place of wound, the message it delivered was like, hey, nobody really wants you. You're not really valuable here. And even if people do want you, you're not even sure. What do I do? I take a bandage. I wrap that bad boy up. That bandage is called accomplishment. And I tell myself, I say, I'm going to keep making accomplishments so people don't need to want me. They're going to need me. <laughs> and then you, that's a great recipe for burnout, divorce, bankruptcy, showing off, insecurity, anxiety attacks. Why? Because you have to succeed. If not, you're nobody. But at the same time, it's in an industry that you fell in love with. And that's so why I, that and I love it. So is staying put because you love real estate yeah. and because <laughs> you fell in love with it. For me, the blood mm. kept seeping through the bandage because I mm. wasn't in love with it. This isn't my passion, was not in real estate. And now moving into music with the accomplishments that I'm starting to make there, now I'm feeling the, the ban- same way. Ooh, you're feeling the bandage come off. Well, it's coming back on. It's just not letting the blood come back. No, no. It's I'm a actually, weird analogy. I, you know, weird but. analogy. I'm <laughs> saying the opposite. I'm saying you, no matter what it is, that bandage, music or real estate, because I love real estate, but that bandage has to come off. At some point. Because I got to address the wound. Yes. And you got to stitch it up. And what you, the way you stitch it up, brother, is you feel it to heal it. You dive into that sucker, like balls to the wall, full out <laughs> commando. Therapy. Boom. And you jump in therapy, you jump in to journaling, you jump into meditation, prayer, whatever oh, it is. Yeah. You jump on in there. And now with you, though, taking away a stressful, like such a high stress industry, real estate, into music, I honestly am fascinated to hear what led to that change. I went from one stressful industry to another stressful oh, industry. Oh, stop. Is music industry very stressful? Oh, yeah. What? It's so full of ego. And oh, my God. If you think real oh. estate is full of ego, just go into music for a month. And it's, it's, Wait, why is that? Is okay, so what do you do? Okay, what hell. do you do? Are you still licensed? Yeah. And I'm actually selling? planning. A, I, I took the broker course, uh, and I have until, I think, 
next summer to take the test. And I still plan it? on doing it. Yes. Because why not? Yeah, sure, so I have my broker's license and I can just like keep that active and it's fine. If I need to go back to real estate, I will. Yeah, if you need to close a deal or two, boom, done. Yeah, friends of mine need to buy a house. I'm always yeah. there to help. I know ever I know a ton of about real estate from working in ten years of it. Yeah. Um but I'm definitely gonna get my broker license anyway. I don't I never wanna take that class again. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other reason. <laughs> yeah, that's the main reason, if we're going to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you got you take your broker class, but I'm very interested. You became a broker. No, I never oh, you became haven't? a broker. No, no. You don't I want to. I will never become a broker of record. That's, that's my fair. dream. That's my godfather's approach. It's the worst thing you know, in the remember world. remember Tony? Tony yeah, Costa? Uh-huh. He, of he course. refuses to get his broker Yeah, license. he's a smart man. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't want to deal with any, like, he has zero talk. Tony, I've only had, like, very, I've had, like, one or two encounters with him my whole life. I remember one time he came to the office at Exit, he was so disheveled. Like, he doesn't dress, like, no, sharp. No, he doesn't care. Yeah, he doesn't care. He doesn't need to. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. He doesn't need to dress, like, like no, I'm nice. Just, I think he I'm pretty nicely like, dressed right now. But I mean, it, people, like, I like to dress up. No, but he, this guy... He does, hates this, it. This guy so does not give a do crap. He is just He's, This guy has more sales, more listings than yeah. most offices in New Jersey. Uh, of course. Alone. He Right now, he probably has... It's probably it's low inventory, so low mm. inventory to him probably means like yeah. fifty to sixty listings, yeah. which is just ridiculous for one person. Yeah. He has one assistant, one person. I think I've yeah, I've spoken to his assistant so numerous this times. Is a, this is a guy that lo- if there's someone that loves real estate more than you and my dad, it's this man. Yeah. He is obsessed with real estate. It's the best. But he will never wear a tie. He will never That's the best. I love dress that man. well. I love this man. He's awesome. I love this man. Can, uh, I, I love this man. Okay, so what got you into audio? Um, well, sorry, what got you out of real estate finally? Well, so it sounds like you're still in it, though. I'm not doing anything in real estate right now. You're not if showing up to an office. If someone asks a question, then I'm obvious. Like if a friend of mine has a problem with their apartment or a house, then I'm going to be at, uh, Someone called you, hey, Sonny, you know, uh, I want to help buying a house. What do you do? Oh, I'll give them straight to my brother-in-law. Okay, Pat. so you're out out. I'm out. Out. Okay. Good. I'm not even helping That's a question. people. Boom. When You're people call me and text office. me, I'm sending their number straight to my brother-in-law, who was my partner. Perfect. And he's taking care of it. Beautiful. Now, second question: What was the deciding factor? What was the moment that you decided to leave real estate? And just, like, I don't want to paint a picture here like a movie, but this is how I see it. Okay. And I become obsessed not just with real estate, but Newark real estate. Like I, all my marketing dollars are Newark. My house is in Newark. My church is in Newark. My restaurants are Newark. Yeah, my Newark, Newark is. Newark. A- Beast of itself. Beast. Because there's people that like even, not to get off track Please. for two seconds, but if you know towns like Westfield mm-hmm. and Warren and stuff, the nice towns, the realtors there, excuse my language, yeah. one, they're all egotistical dipshits. <laughs> two, not all of them, but there's okay. a few of them. No, I'm sure they're very nice. I don't know many. I know a few actually, like I'm friends with the Sue Adler team and they're like super, yeah, super cool. nice, super cool people. But then there's some that are just, you know what I'm talking about. Like, like the bougie, so bougie. bougie like fucking. my office used to be in Montclair, right? And my office, technically, my license still hung in Montclair. Now it's going here. Essentially, best through their office um, since like whatever. The point is, what I've learned from this experience is like the higher upper class, like kind of realtor, like that, like, you know, selling eight, nine million plus. They just see real estate so differently than so I do. So differently. I just see it as like a, like a, we're, and we're in the jungle. And they almost treat you with disrespect coming oh, from Newark. You're in Newark. Ugh, but ugh, then they try ugh. to cut. There's good like, restaurants in Newark. That's what you hear, right? Everest. There's good restaurants. Oh, good food, right? Oh, good food. Oh, oh, good food. Oh, I was, in the, I was in the Iron Bound. I was One there. One time. I was there. I went to the Portuguese restaurant <laughs> in Solmar. <laughs> so, it's Solmar. <laughs> but you go out there. <laughs> but and you go like, out there. Are and you safe? Oh, I feel like it's so. When I that's people, a big question. When I tell people I moved to Newark, and you know, I make probably blows their mind. Oh, I make you know, I make a good living. I'm very content, very happy guy. I make my money, and they're like, "Why would you move your family to Newark?" One person was like, "Aren't you aren't you afraid for your wife?" And I was like, "Ah, it's just not for me, man. It's just not me." Like, and Iron Bound is yeah, nice. I'm, oh, I'm, I live in like a baller building. I, have the, I arguably think I live in the nicest building in Newark, and definitely I have the nicest I apartment in the building. I gotta go check it out, brother. Please come check out my place. Yeah. Beautiful spot. So I do agree, though. The but Newark, my whole thing was that the, the those towns, the nice towns, the rich real estate, the nice. bougie real yeah. estate, those people, those realtors, it's they have it so easy, man. They don't have they're they're the the people who live in the houses they sell want people to come see yes. it when and then they get surprised when they try to come to Newark mm-hmm. and sell a three family here. 
And we can't get them in to it any may apartment. It take three showings. It we take, might need to go one showing. It takes three or four showings <laughs> because the tenant doesn't. The tenant tells you they'll be yeah. home, and then they just won't let you in. And oh, then you yeah. got to make another appointment with the owner to go there with the keys. Yeah. And, and they're selling like two million dollar houses, making five percent. They're hitting with like a quick sixty grand commission. We're over here hustling a two family for four hundred. Yeah, and it's like okay. And my dad thinks that those realtors are going to die out. Like, just they're not going to be needed anymore. He's Clients so are going to be able to. Just go straight into the house. No. Realtors are gonna die. Like in Newark, I'm gonna be honest. Like all these gonna, big programs, realtors aren't gonna exist here, in to those be- towns in ten years. He thinks. He wow. thinks that realtors are only going to exist in towns like Newark, where mm. you need that yeah. person to coordinate everything with tenants and showings and oil tanks yeah. and all this stuff. You need like more difficult transactions. This There's is a what lot I more. Say. I think involved. overall, especially if you like saw the um, the lawsuit right with the commissions, blah, blah, right for the buyer agent commission. Overall, what I'm understanding real estate is this: I don't see agents like as a whole being taken out. I see more and more competition being brought in. So you need to level up your value. You got to take it to the next level. You got to know what you're talking. Even in the high end towns, I do like personally. Let's say I own two million dollar house in there. Maybe I'm charging a lower commission, right? Maybe that's why I'm willing to accept a lower commission. Fine. So maybe not six. Maybe I'm doing four or five, whatever. I, it's like the idea of like being a local expert, truly understanding. And there, brother, I'm telling you, it's all about service. How do I know that? Because even people who are in that bracket, right, they just want convenience. Oh, yeah. Convenience. So the more convenient the realtor can make it, the more it can be a seamless transition that's a realtor that wins. Now, what does that realtor need? Needs a lot of experience, needs a great team of support. They can't be the one-man show. And above all else, they need to be local. They need to know it. Same know the way, area. Like, uh, know like that. I'm talking like, like for example, I know every almost every coffee shop in Newark, I know. Oh, yeah. Almost every coffee shop in Newark. For that, I'm just dying about it. From like North Newark, everywhere. The little bodega coffee shop, like that's crap. Like that kind of, and, and I know your dad used to do that with me. He took me on a tour one day. He would show me all about Newark. And your dad knew everything about Newark. Everything. And everything was crazy. He's I'm like, this guy's around, a mayor. He's walked every street here. Literally. Like, insa- okay, so with that being said, what got you over to, and yes. I, you know, shout out to my, uh, you know, the Sue Adler team. Honestly, really good team over there, though. I highly recommend uh, more like in the Summit Westfield area, Morristown. Yes. But what would you say uh, to your, got to paint the picture how I see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your dad comes in, pioneer, basically dominates. At one point, my mom even worked for your dad, I found out. Like, I think he worked for one exit realty. Lu- she worked for exit realty lucky at one point. Something like this, my mom told me. I didn't know that. I think, I think so, because... Um, there's Jack Everyone's Jack Silva. Every, yeah. Jack Silva's actually Realty Lucky, right? He, Jack Silva, was he? Jack Silva, Jack Silva. Was who owned the who ran the Elizabeth office? The point is this. Your dad comes from nothing. Louis, like what are rock star, comes from Portugal, sells, like pioneers, hustle. He built a team back, he built a brokerage back when there was really no model. He's literally pioneer. They're like innovator, right? So he takes exit, pops off, pops off, five offices. You're born, you guys move out of Newark here, but your dad literally still is like the mayor of the Ironbound, like <laughs> low key, right? Low key. Like low key mayor. And then your dad ends up, uh, then you do your thing, you come into the real estate world. You're the only son, right? Yeah. It, in Brazilian culture, the only son is a big deal, right? Like your oldest eldest son in Portuguese too, right? I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a big deal. So my my mind mind is like, oh, Sonny's definitely and probably unfortunately, you probably had a lot of this assumed unfairly. Uh, but you have like this, like, oh, Sunday's going to take this over. Yes. And it's not, we're not talking just to give everyone clarification. You know, this is not a, like small, you know, we're doing 20 deals a month, a year. No, this is like, you guys were like titans. This was like consistently 36 to 50 million a year. You see what I'm saying? Of sales. It was, yeah. And that's, and that was eight the, offices at one point. So that's what I'm we saying. dwindled so, down to two. Yeah. But, but still, but that's the whole thing though. Eight offices at one point. Eight offices at yeah, one point. Yeah, over 300 agents at one point. So Ridiculous. When you see, so that's why when you came in, uh, Rami was like, my videographer, he's like, who do we have? Or Karina, she was like, who do we have coming today? I said, this guy's the prince. <laughs> he's the prince. My man is the, literally is a prince of the uh, dynasty uh, of Nogueira. Stuff, I never, I've never claimed the title Prince of Newark, but my friends have come up with it. Other random people have come up with How, it. What do you think people. about it? Mortgage people, the the deputy mayor, the, so many people in Newark just call me the Prince of Newark. I'm just like, no, what do you what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, now my royal princehood. Uh, 
what led to the what led to the uh, change into audio? Uh, it's been on my mind for years, but I, it, it it wasn't more of the leading to a change. It was more of like a punch in the face, mm. where I had it's been on my mind for years. I had been so. I was getting so frustrated and irritated in real estate. And I just, it, it led me to the point of complete breaking to where, just to be frank, I was crying every day mm-hmm. it, by myself in my car, just being like, I need, I need out of Burn this. Out. I was so stressed. Wow. I was so Been just there. down on myself. And then the pressure of leaving and the feeling of guilt, because I was, because of all this, Prince of Newark stuff and all of the I have to take over my dad's company at some point and it was like that's for me to do that's like something that's meant for me to do that I have to go and take over and bring this real estate company back up on top and I've been, I never wanted anything to do with that I didn't want to be the leader of the company I didn't want to be the broker I didn't want to be in charge I just wanted to like get by. Mm. That was my whole thing. But then I fell over the years I fell so in love with music and audio and making and recording and bringing artists and musicians visions to life through recording their music. I fell so in love with that. So I I I knew what I wanted and it was always something that I heard motivational speakers say I think but it was like if you don't know what you want to do when you're young, do something you don't want to do. Whenever you and when you're doing that, for me it was real estate. I didn't hate it, but I it was just kind of I was just doing it to do it. While I was there, all I was thinking about was making music, making music, making music, making music. So I know I knew instantly, right? Like when I wanted to leave real estate, that I was going to do that. There's no plan B. I'm gonna go do music. I'm gonna hustle at that and just full force. And I kept thinking, I kept waking up every day and being like, I don't want to wake up when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old and be like, dude, you didn't even try. You tried a little bit, but you didn't even try to do what you were Mm. passionate about. And that was killing me. And if it's killing me now, think about when I'm 60, how much I'm going to hate myself if I don't try to do that, try to do what I love now. Because I can always come back in 10 years be 38 and come to real estate mm. and still be successful in it. But if I don't try now, when I'm 38, still trying to do music, I'm going to look like a total loser, right? Mm. And at 38, realistically, you have the kids, you have yeah, the you wife. Have ki- you have responsibilities. It's, t- it's not have, possible to make I don't even have that. a girlfriend, so you I don't, don't have, have responsibilities girlfriend. You said, I'm right free now. man. Um, why not? So why wow. not? But I'm, yeah, what so I had to have the thing? conversation with my, with my father... About. I'm sure it was a series of conversations. I can't imagine. A, well, he called me in for one of his famous quarterly reviews okay. where he either tells you you're doing great or tells you you got you to gotta yeah. get better and yeah. screams at you. It's um, one or the other. It's <laughs> one or the other. It's always like, you're doing great. Let's keep the ball rolling, blah, blah. Or it's like, you are doing shit. You need to do more. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately. Immediately. I can't even blame. I don't blame. You have it, to go and make 100 calls right now. I literally, like, I so deeply agree with him. Yeah, no, you have. I you so can't agree not, with him. You can't disagree with the guy. If if this is what you want, because he's so right. But only if it's what you want. Yeah, he just wants you to make money. He wants everyone to be financially stable and yeah, successful and somewhat everyone to be somebody. Mm-hmm. But what a beautiful. He, yeah. So I had I come I came in for a quarterly review, and he was like, "What's wrong? You are you're getting so frustrated all the time. You're so angry all the time. No one can talk to you." You flip out at every little thing. And I just broke down right, right mm. then and there. I was just like, I can't do this anymore. I was like, I've been trying for 10 years to like really push myself in this. And I'm just totally burnt. I can't do it anymore. I need to stop. Wow. And he was like, I need to go find something that I'm actually extremely passionate about and chase that. So after that conversation. How do you respond? If, okay, I'm just thinking the father's heart. You know what I mean? I'm sure he. It must be hard for him to see his son, you know, yeah. break down over something well, that, that he loves. But, uh, over something he loves. That yeah. was the, that's the whole thing. It's, I can't imagine how difficult. He didn't that get is. mad. <laughs> he didn't get mad. 
he was definitely not happy about it. Of course. But of course. But he was like he's very supportive about it, honestly. He's as supportive as I could ask him to be. And he because he doesn't understand what I'm trying to do. He doesn't understand what audio engineering is. He because he's not he doesn't not understand. Him. I don't even know what it is, to be yeah. honest with you. I'm thinking you're doing podcasts. I got no clue. Yeah, like no one no, clue. like not, there's a ton of people that don't know. When you listen to your favorite songs, you have no idea how much goes into mm. just making it sound listenable to you to the point where it's not hurting your ears and it's pleasant to hear. Wow. And there's so much work that goes into it's not just recording that song and then releasing the recording. There's so much different things that go into mm. making it sound how to making it sound how you oh. want to hear it and how it's enjoyable to listen to. Wow. So that's no one. A lot of people don't understand what that is, what that means. And I'm not even sure I fully do it this still. Mm. <laughs> I'm still learning. Well, but it's, it's just like your dad said, right? 40 years in yeah. real estate, what are you saying? I know nothing. Yeah, I know nothing. Yeah, and that's... I like, know a lot, and I still know nothing. Like, I know that I don't know. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's so interesting to me getting into the whole music world. After a series of conversations with him, he then came... I saw how angry he was one time because he came home from work. This was after I had stopped working mm-hmm. a couple weeks already. He came home from work... And I have a bad back. Like, I have two herniated discs and stuff. So some days I just can't. I can barely move. Mm-hmm. The pool was dirty. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. He, he got home. He saw the pool, the pool had some leaves in there. He's like, gosh. He started flipping out. And I was like, what is wrong with you? Know you know who that reminds what? me of? You. If you think about the story with the oil tank, right? You get so <laughs> mad. And it's not the oil so tank. Much. It's not the leaves. It's just that it's the industry, else the industry up. builds up. Like even last night, I went, so to, much tension. I went to, I got home last night. Like uh, I did a listening appointment at 630. It didn't go well. I end up 730. I'm pissed. Seven o'clock. I waste my time. I, it was way, I, mean, I shouldn't have gone to a listening appointment. Yeah. End up, I guess, a guard my buddy. And I'm getting to guard my buddy. He's actually from Warren. Um, I get home. I'm on like in, I'm on Instagram driving the whole way home. I get home. I walk my dog. I say that my wife. Hey, just go to bed. I'm gonna stay up a little bit. I went to bed at like two a.m. in the morning, two three in the morning. Why? I was so stressed. I was like anxious. I was like, oh yeah. gosh, I couldn't even go to sleep. So I'm just watching TV and I'm thinking. This morning I woke up feeling ashamed, right? And I woke up and this is what I said to myself. I said, "What you felt was an you felt overwhelmed, very overwhelmed, and that's okay." What's not okay is how you react to it. Yes. And I stayed up late. I scrolled. I watched crap, right? Like, what am I doing watching YouTube videos for until 2 a.m.? Of like some two Indian dudes building a pool. (laughs) With their hands in the the, the village. (laughs) Anyways, my point is, so then your dad- Great craftsmanship. (laughs) Great. True, though. Um, What is the, I guess what I'd say is now that you're, are you already in audio or where are you at now? Uh, So so with the pool story I I was talking about, he- he came home, saw the pool was dirty, came in the, because we have a house, like a house behind the house, mm-hmm. we call it a pool house. That's my like studio in there. And he came into the studio and just freaked out about the pool being dirty and how I'm living in a fantasy world and all this stuff and mm-hmm. screaming. And I was like, what is wrong with this guy? And I, I didn't yell back, kept my cool. Mm. And like two hours later, I was just like, that wasn't about the pool. <laughs> that, Smart that was man. that was because I left. <laughs> that, it, and then it was probably a stressful day. And he was like, I could really who could have yeah. used Sunny today. And then I was It's not even that it you just left. came up to him. It's not even about you leaving. It's about like and me, I'm just like reading it. And honestly, I do we definitely gotta get you down in the park. Um but not with me. No <laughs> <laughs> individual. But what I would say it's like I'm just guessing here, but what these kind of things always come down to in real estate world, I realize is that we've attributed so much of our value and our hopes and our aspiration and our self-worth to the outcome that when that outcome goes into question by us not being in control, we panic. Yeah. Like, holy crap, panic. Panic, panic, panic. So with that being said, you now or have something that your dad never had. You have your dad. Your dad didn't have your dad. Right. Yeah. So your dad is like he. You're learning so much, and you're gonna like treat your son like I was with uh, one. I was with this developer in Newark. He said he's very very wealthy guy, super 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 big time guy, like not small time, big 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 guy, big big. And he said like third generation developer, and in, in Newark, and he said like he's home every day 
having dinner with his kids. I said, why are you home every day having dinner with your kids? He's like, because I didn't have that. And my dad didn't know, my dad had that. He took it for granted, for example, let's say, right? I didn't have that. So I got to do it. So we always are getting better. Our parents mean well. And do we deserve it better? Of course. Our parents are phenomenal. We're yeah. so grateful to have them. Oh, my God, yes. And growing up, I was always, my dad wasn't around too much. Obviously, mm-hmm. He was always home for family dinner. We're Portuguese, so we eat late. Mm-hmm. We eat at like 8 o'clock, sometimes 9 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. A lot of people eat dinner at five. We eat at eight or nine. Oh my god! So he's home for for dinner, and I was used to that. But like he was, he didn't really come to too many like soccer games mm-hmm. or my. Uh, he tried to make an effort sometimes, but he wasn't around too much. So, but I was looking back on it. I'm so grateful that he mm-hmm. wasn't because he's provided so much for yeah. the family, and it can be both. It can be like not even just to the family. He's provided so much for the city of Newark, brother. Even job opportunities. It's ungodly. Not even job opportunities, but everything from making deal, like making things happen in the city itself Mm. with the politicians and with just. I don't even know how much he's done. They almost put a. They asked him, "Do you know a statue on Ferry by Penn Station that Mm -hmm. they built?" They were going around asking a couple people. They included my dad in it. That wow. they, they, he wanted his face included on the statues. Oh, my God. Because he's such a pioneer Prominent of this yeah. area. And he was like, no. I, he was like, I don't want that. Oh, my God. <laughs> he doesn't okay, want hold the on the podcast episode. Like All right. So, Sonny, as we wrap up here, one last question for me. This is not for the listeners. Maybe this is for you. Um, if this is a value, you guys are young family men or women. What would be one piece of advice you would give me as a, you know, came from little to nothing, very grateful for my upbringing into real estate, giving it my all. You've seen me for the past seven years. What would be one piece of advice you give to me as it relates to my son, Maverick? To your son, I think let him find out what he loves. Because if you don't, he might resent you for it. And I don't resent my dad whatsoever. He's given me everything in the world, and his dad didn't have the same up, same financial stability as him, so he didn't have the same opportunities as me. If I was in my dad's position when he was my age, I'd have to work my ass off in mm-hmm. something, and I'd have Period. to. I couldn't just choose could- to take off and go do music. I'd have to be working my ass off, and the fact that I have the opportunity to do what I to, f- the fact that I had the opportunity to find. What I love to do, mm. let alone do it, is huge. So if you were in the, if you have come in the position to, don't force him obviously. But if he doesn't know what he loves, bring him in real estate. If he falls in love with real estate, kudos to you. That's awesome for you. It's awesome for him. Try to give him some time to let him find out what he actually loves, and he will be extremely grateful to you. You'll be the best father in the world. Congratulations on becoming a father, mm. by the way. And if it's real estate, it's real estate. But if it's something else, you got to let them try, I think. Wow. Sonny, incredible time with you. Very grateful to have you. Genuinely, I learned a lot. I've taken away. I'm impacted <laughs> right now. Um, truly, the lives behind real estate. That's a great example. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, Sonny.